He said that one night, the founding fathers of America, the signers of the Declaration of Independence, appeared to him, asking him to make sure that temple ordinances were being done on their behalf. Hello, Saints. My name is Jeff. I am a pastor exploring everything I can about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I've recently relocated to Utah. And one thing I'm discovering very quickly here is that Utah is a very unique subculture defined by this religious group that makes up the majority here, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I'm wanting to explore the history of this subculture, but it's gonna be very difficult here at Temple Square in downtown Salt Lake City because of the amount of construction that's taking place. Temple Square has been the epicenter of Latter-day Saint establishment and church operations, and even leadership from guys like this statue behind me, Brigham Young. So I'm gonna travel down to St. George and get a little bit more of a taste of the history of this subculture from those who settled it themselves, the Latter-day Saint pioneers. And I'm gonna make a few stops along the way. So let's get going. I've recently learned that's really important when understanding the Latter-day Saints moving out to what is now Utah is that at the time in the mid 1840s it wasn't Utah it was just a territory so Brigham Young and the rest of the leaders sent pioneer Latter-day Saints all over the territory in areas even beyond what is now Utah like Arizona and Nevada and Idaho even parts of California and one of these pioneer communities that I want to take a look at is called Pine Valley there was a lot of really good timber there, and they milled wood, not just for these communities, but even for the organ in the tabernacle up in Salt Lake City. It's also the home of the oldest, still active, Latter-day Saint Chapel. So one of the things that's striking me just touring this chapel is the history that's interwoven into its very existence. The, the wood that was milled here and the individuals who built the sawmills and, and listening to the people here who were giving the tour talk about the early settlers, the pioneers, the individuals who made this happen and why it's important to not only the history of the church in Utah as it grew, but also in the families that still worship here to this day. There's one other spot I want to see in this area and it's called Mountain Meadows. It's an area that really highlights the complexities that existed at the time when Latter-day Saint pioneers were spreading throughout the area. You see, there were other non-church members spreading through the area as well as they traveled out west to places like California, and in order to do so had to pass through Latter-day Saint territory. Well, there were some Latter-day Saints that weren't comfortable with that. And sadly, on a Monday morning in September of 1857, a Latter-day Saint militia massacred 120 men, women, and children at the Mountain Meadows Massacre, leaving only 17 young children alive because they were too young to give an account of what happened. And what makes it even more sad is that two days later a letter was received from Brigham Young who told them to leave the party alone, but it was too late. Now since then the church has condemned the actions of what took place, but it just highlights the tumultuous nature, the chaos, and even the missteps that were made as Latter-day Saints were settling in this area.
It might come to surprise to a lot of people that in Midwestern evangelical Christianity, at least in my context, people have heard of the name Brigham Young, but they don't exactly know who he was. Brigham Young was a complicated guy, to say the least. Members and church members have strong opinions, both positive and negative, about this individual who was the second president and prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And even traveling down from the Salt Lake region down to St. George to Brigham Young's winter home seemed appropriate because it was a beautiful journey going through the wilderness as I passed some positive aspects of church history and also negative aspects. And that sort of sums up who Brigham Young was. There were some teachings and decisions that he made that were very controversial and many people to this day very much look down upon. And yet, he was also beloved by many. He was a strong leader. Thousands of people followed him from the Midwest, literally into the wilderness, where Latter-day Saints settled in the Salt Lake Valley and turned it into a thriving land, which is why Utah is called the Beehive State. I just did a tour of the St. George Temple, which is right behind me. It's the oldest temple here in Utah. It's actually only the second temple tour I've gone on. The other one was a brand new temple in Saratoga Springs, Utah. And it was brand new, it was very modern. It sort of felt like a, like a luxury hotel. This building had a different feel, however. It felt very colonial. When I walked in, it felt very historic, very almost Victorian. It had a 19th century flair, even though it's just been renovated. And it sort of screamed, America, Americana. There were a couple points when I was walking through the white hallways and corridors and it almost felt like I was walking through the White House. And then it's actually really appropriate because of something that the first temple president of this temple claimed to have happened soon after the temple was dedicated. He said that one night, the founding fathers of America, the signers of the Declaration of Independence appeared to him. And as they appeared to him, they were asking him to make sure that temple ordinances were being done on their behalf. And there were many claims of appearances of prominent people in previous temples, in the Kirtland Temple, in the Nauvoo Temple, but those were mainly biblical characters or Jesus. And that narrative really does highlight something that I've been seeing time and time again here, and that is how much the American culture, the American narrative, you might even say the American zeitgeist, is interwoven into Latter-day Saint thinking and doctrine, all of which is really helpful as I continue to understand more about this unique church culture here in America. Moving to Utah was one of the biggest decisions that my family has ever made. And it was only made possible with the help of some key individuals, one of them is a friend of mine named Brian. I want to introduce you to him. All right, here's my friend, Brian Hurd from Be Heard in Utah. You are a real estate agent. Yes. You've become much more than that. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're a friend. I always feel like if I'm doing my job right, I'm not really like selling anyone on anything. I'm just participating with them in an experience. Yeah, right? it's, it's a collaboration. It's a collaboration. We're all working together. Yeah. I really do believe that I can see the hand of God in my life every day. Mm. Totally believe that. That's like a mission statement. That's what I believe. And what I love is this unique window I get to people's lives. Like when I think of like moving, I think of what's more important to God than where his children live. Mm. Yeah. That, that's where they're going to find community. That's where they're going to raise their kids. That's where they're going to attend congregations. That's where they're going to hopefully serve other people. Yeah. And I sit there and think like, what an, what a like sacred thing that I get to do. Yeah. In this process. Well, that was one of the things that I think was the best thing that we took away from the whole experience is you balance being professional and personal really well. Thank you. And across the board, you're authentic. So tell people like how they can get a hold of you and like where you specialize. I pretty much sell houses from like Provo to Layton. My phone number is 801-574-5698. My website is B-H-U-R-D 
I N U T A H dot com. Be heard in Utah dot com. Nice. And any information you need to get a hold of Brian, you can find the link down in the description. I'm excited if you're contemplating making this big life decision to partner up with someone like Brian because I can vouch for him. He's amazing to work with. So thanks for being a good friend and thanks for walking this out with us. Dude, love it. Yeah. Glad you're here. As I've made my way back to Salt Lake City and I'm here at the actual grave of Brigham Young, this really is the best place for me to end up because Brigham Young sort of personifies the subculture. And there's something that's really catching my attention about the three labels that are ascribed to him on this plaque behind me, that he is a prophet, a pioneer, and a statesman. Those are really three very important things to the subculture here that from a prophetic standpoint, they strongly believe in the convictions of what has been revealed through their church leaders. Pioneers. There are many Latter-day Saints who are six or seven generations deep with pioneer ancestors. Many Latter-day Saints embrace the conviction that is taught about in the Book of Mormon, that America is a special place and has been ground zero for Jesus's redemptive work throughout the entire world, in the past, present, and in the future. And then as a statesman, Latter-day Saints are very prominent and have a very strong influence in almost every sector out here, whether it be education or media or politics. And do we as evangelicals identify with any of these descriptors? Well, from a prophetic standpoint, I think it's obvious and clear that we don't necessarily believe that the prophetic voice is assigned to one organization. We believe the Bible teaches that in former days, God spoke through prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken through his son. And everything that's been revealed through Jesus, the word made flesh, gives us everything that we need to know about the character and will of God, as it is taught about in the scriptures. And that prophetic voice very much defines who we are as Protestant evangelicals. And though we aren't necessarily pioneers because we are scattered all over the globe, that doesn't mean the geography is not important. When Jesus was giving the Great Commission, he was very clear that we need to go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And it is the global geography that we really focus on in spreading the good news of Jesus. And that's tied to the statesman thing. There are various views within evangelical Christianity as to the role that we should play when it comes to politics and when it comes to social causes. And everyone has an opinion there. That being said, we believe that from a global standpoint, we all need to recognize that we are not citizens of just earthly governments or countries, but that our ultimate citizenship is where Jesus is king, because Jesus came to usher in the kingdom of God. So some of us might feel that it's important for us to bring that into the political sector, but a lot of us just feel that it's important for us to focus on the kingdom that Jesus initiated and the one that he will eventually consummate at the end of all things. And then in the meantime, we need to stand for what's right within whatever social or political context we live in. So there are some similarities and differences, but I must say, just from a cultural standpoint, I've got some adapting to do because where there are similarities, it still feels very different here, which is why I'm going to continue to develop relationships with Latter-day Saints as my neighbors to learn from them and to adapt so that I can understand a little bit more about all that's important to the people who have lived here for multiple generations. So like this video and subscribe. You can support me on Patreon if you'd like. If not, that's totally fine. Just come back, let's keep exploring together. So until next time, I'll see you later, Saints.